Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to D Backs Dispatch. We're getting ever so close to pitchers and catchers reporting, opening day. I'm getting excited every week that we record, fellas. I'm like, we're one week closer, getting very excited. Uh, everyone, if this is your first time on the channel, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe so you don't miss any of our future content. Also, make sure to check out um, our uh, other videos. We have several videos up on the channel right now. Um, so any support is appreciated. Um, we have a few topics to go over uh, today. Uh, we had some rule changes. Zach Gallon said some things, so that'll be fun to talk about. And we had another major free agent signing. So yeah, this should be a fun episode today. Uh, so first, we'll go over the rule changes. The main rule change isn't that much of a big deal to me personally. Um, pitch clock. It's now going to be at 18 seconds across the board. Last year, it was 20 seconds with no one on, and then 18 seconds with a runner on base. Now it's just going to be 18 seconds across the board. Um, Rob Manfred may have saved his uh, legacy with in Major League Baseball because of this pitch clock, because it worked out amazingly last year. Like Everyone was very nervous of the idea. I loved it. I love the fact that we can have games at seven and literally be done by 10 o'clock. I love that idea. That, that, that is the biggest thing um, that worked for me was that the pitch clock actually was a good idea. So Brent, your thoughts on pitch clocks that uh, 18 seconds across the board. Um, I mean, me personally, I was a little shocked that they actually changed it uh, from the one last year to this year. Like I figured they would at least give it another year or two because i knew the the change in the time was coming but honestly i think it's going to be like at least a little more exciting fits the d-backs chaos brand of baseball better so i think we're going to be uh enjoying it and your 18 seconds are up gabe you have 18 seconds to give your thoughts yeah i, I really really like the pitch clock i've always liked it like i was tired of seeing Kenley's and freaking pedro Baez out there for half an hour just trying to throw one pitch like we needed it so badly and you know People weren't holding each other accountable for it. So I'm glad to see finally we got it. Yeah. And the I think the one big negative um, that everyone assumed was part of it was we had a lot of elbow and arm injuries with uh, pitchers early in the year last year. Um, and I think a lot of people assume this was the cause. There's no proof that it was. Um, so we'll have a second season uh, to see how that all works. Um, so for those of you that are watching on the video podcast, you did see we had an 18-second timer, a fantastic idea by our producer, Josh Hunt. Uh, Josh, Hunt. Josh, excellent idea. Um, but no, I, I think pitch clock here, um, excellent idea. Um, next one, um, they reduced mound visits from five to four. Um, I, I don't think that one's that, that big a deal. Um, I, I don't think a lot of teams were even using all five um so reducing it by one i don't think it's going to cause that much of a difference um and then there was some other rule with it where like if you had more than one left or you have one left in the bottom of the eighth you got like one more for the night like it, i i was trying to read up on it and to be honest i i could not figuring out what exactly this whole change was, but uh, mound visits was something that they changed, I believe, in 2022 or 2021. Um, it was the first step of trying to reduce how long these games were. Um, I think it reduced it a little bit, um, but not that much. Uh, Brett, your thoughts on one less mound visit? Uh, so, like you were saying, with the mound visits, uh, like not like teams not really using all them uh, on the MLB website basically when they're talking about all the rule changes. Uh, in 2023, clubs averaged only 2.3 mound visits. So it's honestly, I think it's a, probably a good rule because if anything, it makes you like, if you had so many mound visits, like the extra ones, you could like kind of be like, oh, I could use one in a little strategical way, you know, to be, um, you know, kill some time, let the pitcher warm up or let my pitcher on the mound get, you know, an extra like few minutes where you can still do that, but you got to be more selective where it's like, 
you know, you can't just do that like with your bull, like your your bullpen and your starters like every single game and be like, oh, cool, we have five. Like, uh, you know, pitcher gets hurt, Gabby, you know, signs get crossed up, has to go out there to talk to him. That counts as a mound visit. Like, so you got to be a, at least a little bit more on top of it. But I don't think it's going to be that big of a deal. I think if anything, it's just going to be better for um, the viewing experience. Just because, like it says here. Um, among surveys, mound visits show to be fans' least favorite experience in baseball, or like one of the least uh, favorite events. So I think it's just going to be better for the viewing experience uh, in general. Yeah, uh, Gabe, thoughts on the uh, mound visit limitation? As as Brett said, like for the most part, even with the Diamondbacks, they only did it a couple times, maybe a game, two or three times a game. Like nobody ever fully used their. Um, their five mound visits so i honestly don't really see the reason for giving them four mound visits instead of five since most people don't use them anyways but still it's something that you know needs to be done get the viewing experience a little bit better I'm sorry about that noise it's my dog if you guys can hear that um but yeah it's i mean it's fine it's like timeouts in basketball like we don't want it to turn into the nba where the last 20 seconds turns into another half hour yeah no um, kidding no kidding so some uh game time uh data from last year uh in april games were averaging two hours and 37 minutes and basically every month after that um it went up by one minute so it wasn't going up a lot um it was still well under the what i felt like we were hitting yeah prior was like three and a half hours was the average game time like you're lucky to get a game at two hours and 44 minutes and that's like what it was averaging in september like the longest so i'm i'm like very happy i'm fine with that if it's like a 10 12 score yeah, if or we a get a game. three hour, three and a half out of a three two score, that no, that should not happen. I agree. So, uh, which was very, very rare uh, last year. Uh, so, moving on to the next one. Um, so, it's it's very. I didn't realize that this w- was a big thing, but I guess it is. Uh, if a new pitcher steps onto the warning track. With less than two minutes remaining on the ending break clock, the clock will reset to two minutes rather than two minutes and 15 seconds. Um, Any breaks that contained a pitching change was averaging two hours and 35 minutes. Um, And the broadcasts are only guaranteed two minutes of commercial time. So it definitely sounds like in those uh, scenarios, where it's late in the game, you may potentially have a pinch hitter and there's already a guy pitching and he's either, they're like not sure if they want to have him pitch or bring in. Um, If it's like one minute and 30 seconds or something um, and the new guy steps out onto the warning track, instead of it going to 215, it goes to two minutes. So basically one less pitch. He, he gets one less uh, warm-up pitch there between the two minutes and two minutes and 15 seconds. And I'm going to kind of loop this in with the other big one with pitching changes. So in the past, we saw this a lot late in games. Say you have a right-handed um, hitter up and you have a starter, um, and then they decide to have a pinch hitter. Um, n- in the past, what the... So the offense would announce who the player is. The bullpen would then bring in their guy. The offense would then change who the pinch hitter was. Now the defense cannot bring in a new pitcher. Whatever pitcher was announced as coming in has to stay in regardless if offense changes to another pinch hitter. We we saw it countless times. Usually it's when you're trying to get that uh, correct matchup. So um, this rule at first, I was very confused. I'm like, wait, what is this rule? And then after reading up on it and watching a couple of uh, videos, I'm like, like, ah, they're trying to get rid of this, like two different pitching changes in the span of like two minutes, which just 
a unnecessary uh, delay. So basically, once a pitcher is announced and he comes in to warm up, he he has to either finish the inning or face his minimum of three batters. Uh, Brett, your thoughts on the whole reset uh, break clock with guys stepping on the warning track and this new rule of can't switch out two relievers in the span of not even one hitter. Um, so the, the two minutes instead of two fifteen, like one, I watch a lot of like deep, especially like road games, like deep on like the, uh, um, MLB app. So it is nice to have less like ad time, but in the end it doesn't matter because they'll still like a foul ball happens. Here's a, you know, uh, an ad from 72 hour or 72 sold or whatever. And it's like, so it doesn't really matter. There's still going to be ads. Um, so in the end, like that one doesn't seem like even like a major change. Like you said, is one less, you know, warm up pitch and half the time, like if bullpen pitchers, unless there was an injury, they're already coming in like ready to go. So they probably don't even need that warm up pitch. So I can kind of see why they got rid of it. Um, and then the batter face requirement, that one is uh, like, I was a little bit confused too. At least like the first explanation I heard was on uh, talking baseball. I think John Boy was saying, like, the example he uses, like, Kodai Senga is at, like, 100 pitches. He goes out there in the seventh. Uh, whoever the Mets are facing, they have, like, two righties to start off the seventh and then the lefty. Well, if if Senga's announced as the, uh, you know, the pitcher for that inning, and then the other team goes to two straight pinch hitters f- to basically make it to where there's three straight lefties, uh, like, let's say they're fa- facing the Phillies and it's two righties and then Harper, uh, they can basically like, you know, putting a pinch hitter so it's three straight lefties. Senga has to face those three straight lefties. Like, he can't, like, or, like, if he gets injured, he can get taken out. But the Mets can't just be like, oh, wow, you pinched hit? Like, nah, we're actually going to go to the bullpen really quick and waste everyone's time, even though we just got back from a commercial break. Um, so I think it's it's kind of smart in that aspect. It kind of gives a little bit more of an advantage to the offense. Um, because, like, with a lot of the rule changes and a lot of things, I feel like... Uh, the like defense and like pitching have been getting a little bit of help. Uh, I know last year with like the rule changes on like the uh, base pass, but I think this is, this going to be kind of like, you know, another like uh, aspect to like look for, like, you know, managers, like who's good at making those decisions on like, Oh, you know, I trust my, like, especially with Tori, you know, the leaving a guy in for too long or taking him out too early. This will really come into play where, you know, like for fought, Imagine like looking at the NLCS. Yes, he comes out there. He's announced for that fifth inning. He faces the first two batters. Kyle Schwarber's at third batter. He takes him out so he doesn't, you know, face him for the third time. With this new rule, like he can't do that. Yeah, uh, we're gonna see someone mess this up uh, the first week. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, guarantee. I'm I'm curious. What's the like like uh, the penalty to if you like let's say. The, like again, like the first week, it's new rules. Let's say they do go to take the pitcher out, and like, do they basically tell him, "Oh no, you can't do that," or is there like, is they basically just go, "No, you're blocked, suck it." He stays stays there, or is it cool? He stays there, and there's a penalty to kind of like be like, "Hey, you got to learn the rules along with it." I don't think there's a penalty. I'm just, you know, I'm curious. I, yeah, I don't think there's. Like, I'm like, what penalty would it be? Like that's like the a, thing. A I'm ball sure. uh, on the batter, maybe. Like that's the only thing. So like a box, but maybe I'm I'm not sure. Gabe, uh, your thoughts on uh, these uh, pitching changes? Yeah, well, we got through 9-11 and we'll get through these changes, too. Um, For anybody who doesn't know, that's Gonzo's really weird Sanderson Ford commercial. Like if we see that less, you know, I'll be happy. So 15 less seconds of weird commercials for extends and freaking rhino pills or whatever the hell uh, they're selling on there. Um, I'm happy about these changes in general. Like it is going to be a little bit more complicated, especially to explain to new fans, but overall most of these roles are just minor tweaks and stuff. It's not as crazy as last year. So all in all, they're all fine for me. Like, I don't really care. This one, if some guy has, you know, had to face another guy again, like, you know, you just got to adjust. That's all you got to do. You just got to adjust, figure out what you're doing. I think by the time they um we get to actual games after spring training, everyone's going to know the rules. I don't think there's going to be too many violations. Yeah, uh, we'll see. Um, That's so fun. And, um, I'm trying to read up on it, and I'm, I can't quite – maybe, Brett, you know, 
the widening of the running lane. Does it mean on the in the fair territory they can run on that side now? Is so I'm is? I'm trying to uh, find that too. The like there's so many different articles that have a lot of uh, things. So one of the things I'm seeing is as reported by multiple sources, uh, they're aimed at safety and in line with their goal of shortening the games. A let's see, trying to find the. I think it's just they're making it to where the entire baseline, like the entire dirt. So instead of it before where I believe, at least from what I'm remembering, you know, you have the 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 foul line and then you notice like halfway down, there's that other like little like white yeah. line. Like that's usually where the, when the runner, the runner usually shouldn't is supposed to when they're up by the line needs to be running in that area. That's why a lot of times like, they're supposed to run on the foul. They're supposed side. to run on the foul side. And that's usually where it gives the catcher their throwing lane, whatever, whatever. So I think they're making it now where the entire just dirt pathway, as far as I'm understanding, I could be mistaken, but it seems both like sides. Okay. Both sides, like the entire dirt pathway is the runner's like lane, which to me, it's a little like kind of like that's the whole point of the runner's lane, like is so they can't get in the way of the throw. But I guess maybe at the same time, it's, hey, you're a major leaguer, like maybe make a good throw. Don't peg the guy in the back. But I don't know. It's a double-edged sword. I think it's it can, it can go both ways. I see like both benefits because like runners, we've seen how many in the last few years, especially the controversial like, oh, that's, you know, he's in the way. Like, no, he wasn't in the way. He was in the runner's lane. He wasn't. So I think this is the MLB just being like, that's the entire runner's lane. We're done with this argument. Like, that's yeah. it. Like everyone knows this is a rule now. They can go on either side. And again, we don't see it that the only time you see it is a little dribbler right yeah. in front of home plate. We, any like other ground ball times throughout an entire it, MLB season. Yeah. Like any other ground ball, it's not an issue. Like a comebacker, a little bunch to the pitcher. Like he's not in that trajectory for his throw. You only see it drop third strike, a little nibbler right in front of home plate where, yeah, his. <laughs> His throwing direction literally is right at the runner's back. And yeah, you just, you're a catcher. They're just, they're just, Jose putting Herrera, the, um, make that throw. They should just put in like the, the safety base like they do in softball. Like, I don't know why they don't do that. Like, it's just easier. Um, I think so it's just because it would see. take away the, it's not Major League Baseball. It, that's what yeah, that's Indians stupid. Do. I'm like, Max Muncy tore his ACL, or not ACL, his uh, UCL because of that. I was seen a whole bunch of times like they just run into each other. I'm like, what are you going to do? The runner has a limited space, and the catcher has a limited space to throw the ball. Like even for the for the first baseman, like you only have so much space there. And I don't know. I just don't know why they don't put the safety base in there. I know it's going to look a little goofy at first, but like if we're protecting guys. Like you know, what if a ball goes and hits Shohei Otani in the back of the head? Sure, he has a helmet, but. No, my money maker. See, it's like, funny you bring that it, up like, because, like, I imagine that's what a lot of people thought back in the day when they went from hitters having like they're just standing at the plate wearing nothing to like being like, oh, hey, buddy, you got to have some kind of like protective cap on. They're like, what do you mean? That's goofy. I can, I don't need, I'm not going to get hit in the head. And yeah. we obviously we adjusted very well to that. So yeah. maybe you're and, right, Gabe. Yeah. Um, so our last uh, rule change, it's called the circumvention. Uh, so the pitch clock operator, known as the field timing coordinator, will now restart the clock after a dead ball, such as a foul ball, when the pitcher has the ball and play is ready to resume. There will be no longer be a requirement for the pitcher to be on the mound. Basically, pitcher could be a few feet off the mound, have the ball, walk around a little bit and then get on the rubber. Now it's basically once the ball's in his glove clock, uh, the 18 seconds starts. So it'll be again. It's a, it's a little thing that, that they probably found out was delaying the games a little bit. Cause yeah, maybe sixth inning, fifth inning, you'd see a lot of guys, higher pitch counts, uh, just trying to catch their breath a little bit. Um, that I, I think that's the one big critique we've seen with the pitch clock is pitchers are having to just go a little bit more quickly when a lot of them that's not what they're used to. So is that the cause for a lot of these elbow and arm and shoulder injuries? Never know. Um, but Brett, your thoughts on the circumvention? Um, I 
I honestly kind of like it. Like you're saying, guys trying to like game the clock a little bit. You know, I total again, I was, I, I love pitching. Like the only thing I did basically in baseball is pitching. So I totally get like, you know, you do what you can to game the system a little bit on the mound and all that. But uh, it is, it was a little annoying when you see like the guy get the ball and then like kind of like walks around the mound a little bit and you're like, okay, what's the point of the pitch clock if it's literally not going to be enforced like in the way it should be? Like it's, it's literally just guys finding ways like, Pedro Baez could have. Could you imagine if they had a pitch clock, but didn't let anything? Pedro Baez would literally just stand on the back of the mound, doing his normal routine and everything like that, and then he'd be like, "Okay, cool, I'm ready." Like, so it's kind of smart to have it, you know, be like when you get the ball back. I, again, I I do like how they put in the when play is ready to resume. So it's not like a oh the ball's fouled up in the air while it's still coming, like while it's still in the air, the catcher gets it, throws it to the pitcher, like it's in his hand, but like you know umpires no one else is still ready so it's not like the second it's back in his glove like you know ball's on to him it's good i do like how they have the plays ready to resume so it's not just like a oh hey you threw the ball get the get back on the mound like get ready to pitch nerd but it's not letting them you know kind of get around what the pitch clock yeah. is there for yeah game yeah pitchers are like the biggest Cry babies in the world. Like anytime there's any change, they're gonna complain about it. When they got rid of the sticky stuff, <laughs> yeah. When they got rid of the of the sticky stuff, right away they're like, well, what about injuries? What about injuries? And it, pitchers are, you get injured for like literally anything. Like if they change any role, the pitchers are gonna complain about it. So it keeps them on task, and you know it has it forces them to actually you know keep pitching, do whatever they have to do. Like I, like Brett said, I get it. Sometimes you need to take a you know split second just to like get your breath back figure out what you're gonna do like get your composure but if you're in the major league you should be able to new, know how to regulate your emotions without having to take you know an extra 30 seconds to walk around the mound and stalk it and then use the rosin or whatever to catch your breath like you should be able to do those type of things and i'm sure they're going to work with the pitchers to like help them figure that stuff out but yeah I mean, i'm fine with it it's kind of annoying just to watch them walk around the mound or do random stuff and kick the mound. I'm like, eh, just pick up the right. rosin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's uh, the rule changes for 2024. Uh, we'll see how, uh, see if it makes any sort of uh, impact here. Um, but we do have some Diamondback news to discuss. There was a, a charity uh, golf tournament here uh, Thursday. Friday? It was yesterday. Friday. 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 Um, and we have a little clip here uh, from uh, Zach Gallen on his thoughts in uh, just being in the Phoenix area. Uh, nothing that I know of, honestly. Um, so I, I don't know. It's, I can't speak for the other side. Um, but like I said, you guys were like, I love Phoenix. Um, I love it here. Especially as they're after us having this success um, and and seeing that there's some energy here about baseball and, and the fans, you know, are proving that you know they, they want a winner here. Uh, I love it here. So, yeah, I mean that's where I'm at. Um, if they want to decide to do something great. We'll we'll sit down and, and figure it out and see what happens. But as of right now, not least been done. Mm. So yeah, it definitely sounds like he wants to stay here. It's just he's a Scott. Or his client, so you you just you have to be patient. Like yeah. it, Scott Boris' client is Blake Snell. Blake Snell still has not signed, and whatever Snell is going to set the market. So whatever Snell signs for, we can kind of start to theorize as to what we think Zach Gallon is going to go for. I just. The way he finished last year, I don't, I don't feel comfortable with a, a lot like top tier money. Um, and I think the team felt it too. I, I'm glad that they did avoid arbitration, so we don't really have that hanging over our heads. Um, I just, with him just signing that one year deal, I, I don't think they're gonna do an extension before the season. And I don't. I think they're going to want to see how he does this year. Um, another season under Brett Strom. Um, he still a lot he can improve on. Um, he had. Um, there's just. 
there's a lot of things I feel he still can work on. He has a little bit of Robbie Ray in him where he can't put guys away. So like he'll have innings at like 18, 20 pitches when to be honest, he should have been in like 13 or 14, which you have several innings of that. That's, that's a lot of unnecessary pitches, but um, I I do want Zach Gallon here for the long term. I just don't think at the end of last year it was entirely deserved. He wasn't our best pitcher uh, the last two months of the year. Um, I think it was Merrill Kelly. Merrill was phenomenal. So, Brett, your thoughts on Zach Gallon's quote and his future for the Arizona Diamondbacks? Um, so I, I mean, I, I'm a Zach Gallon homer. Like when we traded for him, like when we traded jazz for him, like I immediately was like, all right, I'm like, this is my favorite player on the team. Corbin Carroll came along and now, you know, Zach Gallon is a very one B, but still up there. So I'm, I'm very happy to hear like just how much he loves, you know, those comments, like the, the article he wrote in the players tribune to like the city of Phoenix and all that. Um, like it, he genuinely seems like he does like enjoy here. And I got, I know a lot of players say kind of like similar things and like, you know, we'll be like, Oh, you know, I love the city, you know, like, but in a very PR way, like just the way it comes across from Zach seems like very genuine. And like, I just, I really appreciate that. Like, especially him being a Boris client, like there's, I would have assumed like, you know, maybe Scott would be like, Hey, you know, like you can, you know, here's the PR like fluffy stuff to say, but you know, don't give any like signs, you know, like don't, don't give away your hand don't like you know give away your leverage because force is a smart agent he's probably telling him that but i personally think zach gallon is going to be worth you know the money like he's he's shown like yes he's he's inconsistent at times but like a lot of major league pitchers are but i think he's shown he is going to be like worth ace money like he there's there's not like <clears throat> There's not many other guys that are going to be able to do what he does. The Diamondbacks have a tough time developing pitching. Like, yes, Merrill Kelly, like, was better than Zach Gallon at the end of the season, but he is a little bit older. Like, Merrill Kelly, like, could be on, like, the downward end. Where I, I don't think Zach Gallon is fully, like, even, like, settled in his prime. He could just now be hitting it. Like, he is, what, uh, he was born in 95. So, like, what, 29? Yeah. Yeah, so, like... I think I think he's definitely worth like the ace money and like maybe not now, but I feel like if if they're waiting for Blake Snell to sign and like you know that sets the market for him, extend him now because maybe it turns into like a Corbin Carroll kind of thing. Like the market's only going to go up like for pitchers, it's just going to keep going. Like I feel like if anything, it's a little down. Like we got Erod on eighteen million, like that just I still don't know how we got that. Um, get him now on an extension because if he has another like good year, like. I think it's going to pay for itself already. And plus, like, it's nice to lock down that ace for the future years. Like I said, we we can hardly ever develop aces. And it's like if we just develop them or trade for them, let them pitch and just let them go every single time, like, you're not going to be able to have a sustainable, like, like team. Like, you can't just always replace an ace. Like, if you have something that you know is, like, fits the team and is good, I'd say, like, full send, go for it. Yeah, if we get first half gallon for an entire season, yes, Zach Gallon could be a, a top five uh, pitcher in Major League Baseball. Like, he was that good in the first half of last year. He just he still put up a 4.3 war, even with like a month of struggles. And, like, and again, I know his playoffs, like, you know, overall don't look the greatest, but that last, that last game in the World Series, like, literally was perfect through six yeah like yeah like, like and that that rangers lineup i know there was they're missing garcia uh like but no, still simeon dude, like, and seager though yeah like that's what i'm saying like he's still like that's what i'm like everyone's like oh he sucked in the playoffs yes he had a few games but he still did good against like the game against the dodgers he still did good that like he went perfect for six in against the rangers like and that was at the end of the year you know like like pretty gassed like uh, i'd say you know the longest he's pitched into a season in a while. So having that experience now going into next year, I th I think it's going to be just nothing but good. Yeah. Uh, Gabe, sorry. Uh, sometimes when I have something to say, I'm like, uh, I need to get this out or else it's, it just doesn't seem uh, relevant, but Gabe, your thoughts on our ace, Zach <clears throat> Allen and this quote. Yeah. Like, I think gallon should be around 30 million a year, anywhere from 25 to 30. So I'm sure the Dynamics have thought about it. Like, to, let's get, you know, eight years, 200, eight years, 240, or whatever it is. But Scott Boris is probably in, like, in the 300s at this point. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, he deserves money. Like you guys are talking about the um, his scuffles at the end of the year. It could be growing pains. This is the most he's ever thrown. But he showed that he can be a 200 inning guy. Like how many guys in the league can throw 200 innings? We had what seven maybe last year total. And every team, there's at least five starting pitchers. You're talking about maybe 200 pitchers in the league. No, only like. Seven of them through 200, 200 innings, and that was Zach Gallon. That was the first time a dying back has thrown in over three years since the 2019 season, I think. Um, so yeah, if he if that's who he is, if he's a 200 innings, 200 strikeout guy, like you need to lock him up somehow. Uh, whether it's eight years, even maybe even extend to 10 years just to see how he, he's going to age, whatever it is, they need to lock him down. He wants to stay here. Um, but Scott Boris being Scott Boris, he's probably going to end up getting $300 million from like Kansas City or something stupid like that. But we have to just wait and see. Hopefully they can work something out. Maybe Gallon putting the pressure a little bit on Boris. You guys are talking about Blake Snell. We are, what's, 30 days away from pitchers and catchers reporting, and Blake Snell has yet to sign with the team. So that means he hasn't met any coaches. He hasn't met any pitching staff or anything for any team so it's getting late early like we it's going to be really bad and i think a lot of these boris guys are going to be really real affected by this they're probably not going to come out of the gate really good so montgomery and snell we you got to make a decision soon oh yeah now that you say i don't think montgomery has signed anywhere oh yeah wow um either um i i don't think he's a scott boris client but that that was someone that when he went to Texas, he he definitely deserves to get paid. And I think a lot of teams are like, well, before you went there, you were very inconsistent. Um, and I think Blake Snell and the Yankees were close, but I think they were just too far apart of the money. So Yankees pivoted and got Marcus Stroman, Stroman who has blocked all of his fan base <clears throat> on Twitter uh, <laughs> from a little uh, very rough week he had uh, just with the fan base a couple years ago. So it's, it's, I think it's hilarious. Um, but uh, Gabe does have to go. He does have plans. Gabe, we do appreciate you for joining us for the main portion of our show today. Uh, Cause we know how much you love that gown. Like we all do. So, all right. uh, everyone make sure to give Gabe a uh, follow. Um, his Twitter will be in the description box below. Um, there is another clip that I want to play. Um, because I think it's hilarious. Uh, so at this same uh, golf tournament, uh, we got a clip from Alex Thomas saying, is he the best golfer um, in the outfield? So, Who is the best golfer out of, uh, out of the outfield? The outfield? So, yeah. Uh, me. Okay. Uh, that's not saying much, though. <laughs> uh, Corbin's pretty good, though. I, I played with him, and he's sneaky good, but... Not like sneaky under a hundred good, but um, yeah, that's yeah. I don't think we got much to show for it in, in, in golf. Not Jake, huh? No, not at all. I don't think Jake even has ever swung a, a golf club. But he, he, I have seen him a few times actually. Uh, it's not very good, <laughs> but we're all not very good, so it's okay. Sounds like the pitchers would have you beat if it was pitchers versus hitters. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a given. I mean, they have all the time in the world to, to work on the ball team, so um, we don't. So if it was any other sport, I think you know, just just players got it. I love how he's roasting the entire. <laughs> he's like, uh, Jake's never picked up a golf club. Um, I thought when I saw this, I was like, this is great. Like, and I love. He's like, well, pitchers don't work on like they work like one day a week. Um. So and yeah, like, of course, uh, of course they have time. Um, hitting Alec, the golf ball is hard, man. Dude, golf is. If you hard. have a base, if you're used to swinging like a like again, I wasn't the best hitter, but like I'm, I'm just used to like the baseball swing to a first time swing in a golf club. I I did not know what to do. Like I just kept hitting the ground, like shanking it. Every, like it, it's rough. So I can see where like yeah, if you're a pitcher, you don't work on hitting to where like yeah, you can practice your golf swing more. Where if you're a hitter, you're literally. <laughs> Fine tuning a completely different swing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm not surprised that Corbin is somewhat good too, because is, is there anything that man can't do? Corbin is 
Corbin is just a talented individual. Wasn't there a video of him and Gallon from the MLB uh, like a few weeks ago? Like them, like him and Gallon, just them two golfing, and Corbin just hits a goddamn rocket. Where I'm like, okay, yeah, like doesn't surprise me. He just isn't bad at anything. Yeah, um, it's just, he's going into his sophomore season, and we all know a a lot of guys struggle. So I'm hoping um, he doesn't struggle too much, or if he does, it's not for a long period of time maybe a couple of weeks um but man corbin is so much fun to watch like corbin really is one of my favorite play uh, players to watch we got him for a damn steal when we when he signed that extension before the beginning of last season like it it's a steal after the season that he had like it's simply amazing um, so yeah, uh, very excited there. Uh, moving on to our final topic of today's episode. As I said, we do have a major free agent signing. Josh Hader signs with the Houston Astros. Uh, I believe it was what five years and 95. Yeah, I believe was, uh, the deal there. He wanted more money than, um, uh, Diaz, which I don't know if he deserved, um, because there was there were a lot of reports coming out that he uh, in San Diego, like he wouldn't pitch either back to back days or three straight. And when the Padres there late in the year needed wins to even sniff the uh, wild card, the fact that he wasn't willing to come in and pitch to preserve a win to me, left a very bad taste in my... I'm like, so you're just out for yourself. You're not here to help your team. Go ahead and uh, make the playoffs. Um, everyone says he's a he's a top closer. I agree. Um, if you just look at his number, like, he'll, he'll go on stretches for, like, two months where he literally doesn't give up anything. No runs like he is, and like he gets like his KB per nine is is ridiculous. Like he is he is a top five closer. I mean, I'm not gonna dispute that, but I'm not a fan of the whole. Yeah, I don't want to pitch on back to back. Now nah, I'm not gonna pitch in three straight, even though my team needs it to get the save. So, um, Houston's gonna have a great bullpen though because. Presley is also a very good closer. Presley, they got a uh, God. Who else is in their bullpen that like was disgusting? They even had a dude that was a part of their World Series run um, that had a down year in twenty two. But I remember that World Series run, and I was like, the Astros just found this guy, and he's throwing like one hundred and two mile an hour sinkers. Oh okay. no, uh, Brian Abreu. Yeah. Oh my God, Abreu, Presley, and then Hater. Good luck, American League. Yeah, if the Astros have a lead going in the seventh, good luck. Um, cause those are three really good, uh, arms there. Um, yeah, I still, I think Houston's on its way down personally, um, with, uh, Verlander kind of there, uh, getting up in age, um, Altuve's up in age, Bregman, but they do have Jordan. Jordan is a special, indiv um, special individual, now, with Otani out of the American League, I think AL MVP every year is going to be between Jordan and Judge. Um, yeah, it just depends. Pretty much. Like, Jordan missed like 30, 40 games last year, but he was like top five in home runs. That's unbelievable. Like, that's ridiculous. That's how good Jordan Alvarez is. Thank you, Dodgers, um, for trading him away for, for a bag nothing. of peanuts. For, for Josh bag. Fields. Yeah, like that. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if you literally on? imagine your dot? Like, just even thinking about a, a lineup with like Mookie, Freddie, now adding Otani, and then like your Don in there, I'd, I would literally be able to like, okay, like there's your yeah. four all stars every year. Like, the Dodgers should win 100 games easily. There is no reason why they should not win 100 games. I, I genuinely think they might break the 
all-time win record. Like, again, like, it could be, you know, we saw it before with a lot of teams. Like, just because you get a lot of, like, you know, free agents, some guys can still have down years. Some guys can still not mesh well. Some guys can have trouble transitioning. But I genuinely think, like, they stumbled into 100 wins last year with, like, just a rookie rotation and, like, even the bottom half of their lineup. Like, they miss Gavin Lux, missing a bunch of people, like, missing Dustin May. I genuinely think they have a good shot with, like, just on paper of breaking the uh, single-season all-time win record. Yeah, and it's going to be great because they're <laughs> they're going to lose. In the they're going to have round. so many high expectations, where it's going to be like every year, like you have, they to, have win to win the World, the World Series. Series next year. There, yeah. if they don't win the World Series, it will be a. Dis- I don't care if they make the lead championship series; it is a disappointment if the Los Angeles Dodgers do not win the twenty twenty four World Series because the top four of that lineup is straight deadly. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Josh Hader, um, he's probably the best closer in the uh, American League now, because um, yet he, ha- he has not pitched in the American League. He's been with the Brewers and with the uh, Padres. Um, I know a lot of Diamondbacks fans this offseason was like, "Why don't we go after Hader?" I'm like, "We don't need Hader. We have Paul Seawald. We have Brett's favorite guy, Kevin." Kevin, Kevin Ginky. Ginky with the stinky. Yeah. Like, so um, I got their stats right here. Obviously, like, you know, Hater had like, you know, 2.4 war, 1.2 ADRA, 33 saves. Great year. Like you said, he's top five closer and no debating it. Kevin Ginkle in a setup role this year, 1.2 war, 9-1, 2.48 ERA, four saves. Um, and I wish I could find his splits. Maybe I can, we'll... Uh, look at something like that and have stats on it later. But once once Seawald came over, dude, Ginkle became such an like a different person. And the fact that he did what he did and we got him for one million and Hader's getting paid how much per year? And again, very very different worlds. Hader nineteen Ginkle, million. Yeah, nineteen million. Again, very different worlds. Very different pitchers levels. Like you know, one's a closer. One is a dude that had a very very good season and you know pretty decent track record so far. But Ginkle getting one million and then Hader getting nineteen along with Seawald at 7.4. Like, again, I think our bullpen is still cheaper than just one year of Hater. So I'm I'm yes. still shocked <laughs> by that. It just makes me h- hope that our bullpen pieces don't get outpriced in a few years. Like, again, s- pitchers especially don't have, like, the kind of peaks that a lot of, like, uh, um, haters have, where, like, most bullpen guys have, like, one or two, like, really good years and then, like, some okay years. But... If we can just keep the the core of the bullpen around too, along with the rest of the team, like Thompson, Ginkle, um, Dre Jamison when he comes back, like I'm I'm very confident in that. Like I just I just don't want them to have to pay like Ginkle like 15, 20 million with the the pace that he's on. Yeah, so I was looking at his advanced uh pitching, his batting average against has gone down every year. Um 2020 he was at 318. 21, 268, 2022, 243. It was 181 last year. Like, he's getting better. OBP has gone down, like, increasingly. Slugging against has gone down. OPS went from a 961 or 900 OPS in 2021, or opponent OPS, to a 547 in 23. Damn. Thank you, Brent Strom. Like, Dude, I'm no kidding. Think- I think it's a mixture of Brent Strom and just Kevin Ginkle being up here and Getting that experience facing major league pitching does that. His um, ground ball percentage is almost at fifty percent. His walk is, percentage went from like yeah, like sixteen in twenty twenty, and then it was ten percent, eight percent, nine percent. Like it's just in, like slowly been increasing. One of the few good things that Tucson, Arizona, has provided, right? Just, uh yeah. <laughs> I'm um, just kidding. Our eighth and ninth inning with Ginkle and Seawold has me very excited uh, because. I know a lot of people like because Seawalt struggled like his first couple outings here. They're like, uh, did we make the right move? But then after that, it was clear sailing. He had one bad outing in the postseason. Unfortunately, it was a World Series game that caused a loss. But it's I still have nightmares. Still. I'm fine with that because we saw what we've had the last few years. Miguel Castro blew at least four games. Two against Atlanta, by the way, uh, which mm-hmm. we did uh, discuss on our last pod that he, uh, 
Miguel Castro cost us a, two sweeps of Atlanta because he couldn't close that out. So I I am not a fan of the closer by committee for a full season. I'm fine with it for a stretch. Um, but I think every team should have an actual closer because we we saw what this team did when they had to sign roles. When Sewell got here, everything else fell into place. Everyone knew their role going to the ballpark that day. Ginkle knew eighth inning is mine, unless in the seventh, like they had like the heart of their lineup, which I think is just what you want to do. You want to do with your best non-closer reliever, the seventh or eighth, is depending on the matchups. If the harder guys are in the seventh, bring them in the seventh. If the harder guys are in the eighth, bring them in the eighth. So, um, and I think Tori realized that too. Um, we have one other minor story. I don't think there's a lot of information on it, um, but uh, Bally Sports um, Group, who has filed for bankruptcy, uh, was purchased by Amazon, which has me intrigued um, because so it, it's weird. There are still some sports teams that have their games on Bally, but some of them don't, which I always found that interesting. So, like, so Bally's is choosing what teams to pay and which ones not to pay. They didn't pay the San Diego Padres. They didn't pay the Arizona Diamondbacks. This is the first news we've gotten all off season as to kind of how the broadcast of games is going to go for the Diamondbacks this year. Um. I'm curious to see. I'm hoping we get some more news, at least during spring training or before spring training, because I know they usually uh, broadcast some games in spring training, but it's usually like the last two weeks or so. Um, so I'm hoping, like, is it going to be an add-on if you have Amazon? Is it going to be like it was uh, last year with MLB.TV where you can buy a team-specific MLB.TV subscription? Um, because they did that for the Padres and uh, Diamondbacks. So this was just a little bit of news. Um, I was excited. I like watching stuff on on Amazon. So Same. Your thoughts? I, <clears throat> I honestly think it's – I think the D-backs are in a weird little like, limbo with it where all the other teams that are like – they still had their stuff like, you know, on Bally. Like, like the Twins, I think, were one of the teams that still had everything on Bally. So everyone that was still – getting their games broadcasted through them, I believe will now be on Prime. Or I think the D-backs and Padres are a little bit in that weird limbo where, like you're saying, they could still just have the team-specific package on MLB uh, TV, or they could you know, be like the other ones when Bally and be on Prime. I wouldn't be surprised if they keep it because I believe with the Diamondbacks already like going to court over this with Bally and like, if I'm not mistaken, like actually reaching like a settlement or like final like finalization of whatever they went to court for. I believe they would probably still just stay on MLB TV is my best guess, which I mean, I don't know, depending on, like you said, if Amazon prime is going to charge basically like the same price for uh, games on there. It, it, I mean, it'd be kind of cool. Like if Amazon did like every single team that it had the rights to, you just pay one price, no blackouts, no nothing that I would be like, cool. Throw the D backs or the Padres on there. Get every team on that blackout suck. Um, but I just, I don't see that happening personally. I think the MLB is going to be like, cool. No, we still want to have people, you know, pay the extra money to watch the teams they want to watch stupid. Um, so I think they're going to be staying on MLB TV. I like it though. I think it's a good sign. Yeah. For right now, I'm just going to buy MLB.TV and use my VPN. Like I've done like the last four seasons. It works. Hey, they don't know that I'm not in Canada. I seriously, I literally just put my uh, VPN anywhere, not in, not in Arizona and it works yeah, most of the time, New York. And it's like, Oh, look at that. Welcome. Welcome in New York, Arizona Diamondback fan. You can watch the game. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was our episode here for today. Uh, we do appreciate everyone for tuning in. Like I said, make sure to like comment and subscribe. You'll see all of our socials in the description box below. Make sure to check us all out. Um, our Twitter is at Dbacks Dispatch. We are also on Instagram and TikTok. Make sure to go ahead and check us out. We will see y'all next time. He survived 9-11, and together we'll survive this too.